Thank you for tuning in today at Propel Church. Whether you're watching through YouTube or listening through a podcast, we want to say thank you. Our hope at Propel is that you would be propelled into an authentic relationship with Jesus. From wherever you are tuning in, we hope that you are encouraged and inspired by this week's message. I'm really excited about this weekend. Not only are we kicking off a brand new series, but uh, I am coming back. I'm pretty fired up. We kicked off this thing a couple years ago, actually last year, uh, called a Lead Pastors Getaway. And what it was was I was talking to some friends of mine in ministry, and I had about seven phone calls in a week with pastors who were ready to quit and give up. I was like, we got to do something about this. Because God designed, you're never going to have a healthy church without a healthy pastor. And so we were looking at what to do, and I was thinking, man, I've got some good rest rhythms. What if we took pastors to the mountains for three days, and we didn't give them an escape, but we taught them how to be equipped for rest and longevity in ministry. And so this past week, we had pastors fly in on Sunday night from California, Ohio, Michigan, all over the U.S. They came in for a getaway. And on night one of these trips, pastors come in, and you'll hear things like, I'm lonely. One pastor said, I'm so uh, exhausted because of the stress of ministry. Four weeks ago, I had a stroke and almost died. Pastors were ready to quit. They were ready to throw in the towel. And through opening God's word together, creating a space where they could rest, they began to get refreshed and really excited. I want to show you a picture. This is Pastor Adam. And uh, come on, he's got a big old brown trout in his hand. (laughs) But we took Pastor Adam out. He came in on night one and uh, was considering quitting. He was considering throwing in the towel, and he wrote a note to you just as a a message of encouragement. He said, I'm so thankful for Pastor Nick and Propel Church for the opportunity to attend the Lead Pastor Getaway. As a pastor, it's easy to find yourself in a dry place with limited or no options to be refreshed and renewed. This weekend has refreshed my soul on so many levels. Pastor Nick spoke into my life as well as the life of others in a way that has impacted my ministry. He challenged us to rest and not escape and gave us the tools to ensure that we would have a long and impactful ministry. Transformation happened on a deep and life-altering way. Again, thank you. So come on. I just want to say thank you, church, for giving me the ability to pour into pastors all around the world. And I'll tell you why it's important. Because of what God's doing in Mount Pleasant, we're going to have the ability to impact hundreds, even thousands of people But with what we do to invest into other churches around the world, we're going to impact hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. And I'm excited to see the kingdom advance. Can we put our hands together one more time this morning? Come on. And kind of with that in mind, I want to kick off a brand new series today called Compelled. And this series is going to be designed to ignite some evangelistic passion inside of you. And if you don't know what evangelism is, that's okay. Evangelism is where we share the good news of Jesus with the world. See, there is a lost, hopeless, and broken world. But there's a Savior who came, died, and rose again so that people didn't have to live in bondage and captivity, but that they could have new life. And God's rescue plan for the world is not just to have great church gatherings, but the purpose of these gatherings is for you to be equipped, to be compelled, to go out into your workplace and into everywhere that God has you, whether it's work or school or in your friend group, and proclaim the goodness of God to the entire world. And so my hope is to get us kind of passionate and fired up about this as we head into the Easter season, because I'll tell you this, sharing the gospel is essential as long as heaven and hell are realities. Now, if we don't believe in heaven or hell, none of this matters. But if we really believe that there is a heaven where people will spend eternity with God forever, and there's a hell where people will spend eternity separated from God, then we have to be called to action. We have to be moved in a way where we say, hey, our goal is to bankrupt hell and impact heaven. Oh, 9 a.m. I don't know. I say, I told you I was coming in fired up and I was coming in excited. And so you're going to have to help me preach this because I, I get to do this twice today. So come on. I would love for you to help me. Now, sharing the gospel is essential as long as heaven and hell are realities. And it reminds me of Mark chapter 16, verse 15. This is what Jesus said. It says, and he told them to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. 
Not just preach the good news to people you like or people who vote the same way as you do. Not just to preach the good news to people who share your social media posts or the people who you don't get into arguments with on social media. If you do get into arguments with people on social media, you should probably stop that, right? But it says to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. What he's talking about is, hey, there's people, if they believe in Jesus, they'll spend eternity with God forever. But if we don't, we'll spend eternity separated from God. But Jesus is telling people in this moment to go into all the world and to preach. And as I was thinking about this, it would be easy for us to feel like Jesus is only talking to the disciples. He's just talking to the elite of the elite, the 12 men who are going to change the world and flip it upside down, but that is not who Jesus is just talking to. Yes, the disciples were present, but there's also an entire group of people that are around in these moments. And when Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the good news, he's talking to every single person who would claim to be a follower of Jesus. Because preaching is not just something that a person does on stage. It's the way we live our lives as followers of Jesus. So I wrote it in my notes this way. Every follower of Jesus is called to preach. You may have grown up in church where they use this term called to preach as a way to describe what the pastor did, right? The pastor, he was called to preach, you know, right? Good old Southern Baptist church. But if we look at the gospel, if we look at the good news of Jesus, what we'll find out is that every single follower is called to preach because to preach is to just proclaim. All we're doing when we share Jesus with others is we're proclaiming the goodness of God. Some of us have an issue doing that, but we don't have a problem preaching about other stuff. You ever ate a good barbecue sandwich and you said, mm-mm, right? Like, <laughs> I got to tell you, I just had a barbecue sandwich. It changed my life. What am I doing? I'm preaching about the barbecue, right? I've preached a lot about smoke pit. Come on, somebody. Maybe it's not like that for you. Maybe you got a brand new car, and so you were telling everybody you could about how this brand new car changed your life. It was amazing. But you know, God's desire and design for our lives is to have way more passion about his good news than any good news we could find in this world. Every single follower of Jesus is called to preach. So the question really becomes, what am I preaching about with my life? What goodness am I proclaiming? How am I sharing Jesus with the world through my words? And, And I would submit it to you this way. If someone, if the only way someone came to know God was through an encounter with you, would they actually come to know him? Because that's what God desires for our life. He desires us to live in a way that in everything we do, everything we say, Paul says, in all things we give glory to God. You're called to preach. And to illustrate this idea further, I want to take you to quite literally my favorite passage of scripture in the entire Bible. Now I tell you, I like the, I'm like, it's like my favorite passage. I think at least for today, for the next hour and a half. This is going to be my favorite passage of Scripture. If you have a Bible, go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. It begins with this. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize them, his disciples did. Just a side note, that's good leadership. If you ever want to know what it looks like to be a leader, it's to empower others. It's not to do all the work. When you do all the work, you end up burnt out. But when you empower other people, you'll actually step into what God's called you to do. Ephesians 4, the role of the pastor, prophet, evangelist, teacher is to equip the saints for ministry. This is what Jesus is doing. It says this, so he left Judea and he returned to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria on the way. That's going to be important later. Let's keep reading. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sahar near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well. It was about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. 
He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. John 4, 1 through 8. The first time I was reading through the text, I thought it was really interesting that Jesus has to do something. He is fully God and fully man. So to say Jesus has to go through Samaria, the first logical rationale was that the only path to get from Judea to Galilee was to go straight through Samaria. But when we look at the map, right? Come on, sometimes you just got to pull out a map. It's not Google Map. Those weren't around yet. But praise God for Google Maps. Can I get right? Come on. I don't know where I'd be. Well, I'd be lost without Google Maps. That's exactly where I'd be. But when you look at the map in this time period, there were typically three paths that Jewish people would take to go from Judea or from, yeah, from Judea over to Galilee. And as we look at the paths, none of them were to go through Samaria. And the reason why none of them were to go through Samaria is because Jews and Samaritans had some really big beef with one another. In, in fact, Jews would refer to Samaritans as pagan half-Jews. They were people who couldn't cut it and weren't up to the standards that God had. They were mortal enemies. That's why in all of the gospel, Samaritans would fall under that category of Gentile. And so as Jesus is preaching to the people, he says that God came for the Jew and the Gentile. It's yeah. God who he's for us and for them. But as we're looking at the text and we see that Jesus has to go through Samaria, in reality, that's not true. Right. When we look at the maps, we see there are plenty of other options that would keep him out of the way of going through a town where there would be beef with other people. But no, the text is very clear. Jesus had to go through Samaria. And the question becomes, why? And the answer is because Jesus had to in order to obey the will of the Father. Because Jesus only did what the Father told him to do. He only went where the Father told him to go. And Jesus has to because his purpose on earth was not to avoid conflict but to save souls. So he has to go through Samaria. He's on mission. He's focused on purpose. Where Jesus would go would be where people wouldn't go before. What Jesus was going to do was he was going to show that he came for the broken, for the ostracized, for the outcast, for the people who were discredited by others. Jesus had to go through Samaria because he was on mission and he was going to do the will of the Father. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that Jesus goes out of his way to encounter the broken. He goes out of his way to encounter the broken. Now, all of us at some point are that broken individual, and I think we're going to be able to see that in John chapter 4 in just a second, that we have a lot more in common with the broken than we realize. But if you really want to share and preach the good news of Jesus with people, there's going to be times where you are inconvenienced by the route that God wants to take you. There's going to be times where you encounter brokenness in order to help them encounter Jesus. And it may mildly inconvenience you, but if it inconveniences you for a moment but saves them for eternity, at the end of the day, it's worth it. Right. It may mean that we have to quit walking past every homeless person and judging them for the position that they're in yeah. and be mildly inconvenienced for a moment to just stop and look at someone who's broken and hurting and share the good news of the gospel with them. And I'm not saying, I'm not telling you to pick up every hitchhiker, right? That's, I don't need you calling me or being on a 48-hour special. That's not, that's, <laughs> I don't have time for that. What I'm telling you is, when you feel like God is leading you in a specific direction, sometimes it's going to be different than where you think you want to go. You can go to the book of Acts, and you can even see in Paul's life, that the scripture says that Paul was compelled to go to Rome by the Spirit. He didn't want to. He was actually going a different way. But the Spirit compelled him, and he was obedient. And because of that, we saw the gospel continue to advance. As we look at the text, what we see is that Jesus sits down at a well, and we get to see the beauty of his humanity because he comes to draw water. It's about noontime, and this woman comes. And culturally, you don't draw water in the hottest part of the day. You draw water 
in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening. But the reason why this woman has come to the well at noon is because she is trying to avoid other people. In fact, we're going to find out in just a moment there's some relationship issues that she has, and everyone in the town knows about it. They've been talking about her, so she is trying to avoid them completely. So she comes to the well at noon so that she doesn't have to talk to anybody, so that she doesn't have to encounter anyone. But in the moment when she is trying to avoid everyone, God meets her right where she's at. In a moment where she thought everyone had forgotten about her and left her, no, God was right there. And Jesus is sitting at the well with her and begins to strike up a conversation. Now, culturally, this is not acceptable because she's not a a Jew. She's a Samaritan, but she's also a woman. And in this context, that was absolutely unheard of. But Jesus doesn't care about what's socially acceptable. He came to seek and save the lost. So he speaks directly to her heart and is having a conversation. And it begins with something as simple as asking for some water. But this woman goes, well, sir, I can't get you any water. You don't have a rope or a bucket. Right? She's not going to understand what Jesus is trying to talk about. But then Jesus goes a step further, and this is what it says in John chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks of this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never become thirsty again. It will become a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And she says, please, sir, the woman said. Give me this water. Now, this is really important because every single one of us have a well that we draw from. Now, for some of us, we have the same well like this woman. She has some relationship issues. We'll unpack that in a second. For others of us, we draw from the well of alcohol or we draw from the well of pornography or we draw from the well of the approval of other people. No matter what well you go to in this world, what Jesus is trying to articulate and communicate is you can have temporary water, but guess what? You will be thirsty again. No matter how much sin you indulge in, it will never satisfy. You thought it would, but it will only temporarily quench your thirst. And in a moment, you'll be coming right back to the well. And you thought it was just going to be a one-time thing, but you have to keep coming back because you never were satisfied. And you'll come back over and over and over again. But there's a way to never be thirsty again. And it's not through anything in this world. It's only through Jesus because it's in him that we are actually satisfied. The longings, the desires, the cravings, the things you've been looking for your entire life are only quenched through his spirit. So he gives her this moment, and if you've been here before, you know just how important it is where you feel hopeless and stuck, and you know you were made for more, and you know you don't need to come back every day to the same thing over and over, but you just can't escape it. And Jesus says, if you'll drink of this water, you'll never be thirsty again. And she looks at him and she says, I want it. Give me this water. But look at it. Then... I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here and get water. Her motivation in this moment is selfish. I don't have a ton of time. I only got 16 minutes left, but I'm I'm just going to give you something really quick. Here's the good news. Even if you have selfish motives when you begin to follow Jesus, God will use your selfish motives to redeem them for his purpose. Sometimes we think, oh, we got to be, we got to be perfect. No, she was looking to just get something out of this for herself, but she's about to have an encounter with Jesus that changes her life forever. So she says, come on, I want some water and I'll never have to come here again. And so Jesus responds, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. But she said, well, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus says, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and the man you aren't even married to, you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. (laughs) It's interesting that Jesus 
would have this conversation. He would see every issue that the woman has. And as he's articulating this thing of living water, what he's doing is he's communicating the thing that stands in her way of receiving the gift that God has. But I think it's a little bigger than that because as Jesus points out this issue that this woman has, which is in the area of relationships, um, can we be honest? Nobody loves their dirty laundry to be aired out. Nobody loves for someone to know everything you've ever done. And I know that you may not have the story of this woman, but we all have a story very similar to this. We have a story where we have sinned, where we've fallen, where we've making, made mistakes. It may not be in the area of relationships, but what Scripture says is that every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You may have grown up in a perfect Christian household, but from the moment you entered into the world and sin entered into our lives, we were separated from God because of it. It's not a weighing system of is your sin worse or better than mine. All sin has equal penalty. Now, there is sexual sin that has different punishment, but from the moment we sin one time, the penalty is death. Yeah. That's what we deserve, but praise God, we have a God who gives us what we don't deserve. So why is it important for Jesus to have a conversation with this woman and point out the relationship issues she has, having full knowledge of it? It's important because Jesus knows what we've done, but he chooses to sit at the well anyways. He knows every sin issue you've ever had. He knows the mistakes you've made in your life. And from the beginning stages of this text, he would decide to have a conversation with you. He would decide to not be like everybody else who would ostracize you and pull you away for your problems, but instead he would choose to be on mission, to come and save and set you free. He would choose. Here's, here's the thing. A loving God does not avoid your sin. He can it. Right. A loving God doesn't hide away from truth. He points it out because he wants what's best for your life. Right. Yeah. But with the full knowledge of all the mistakes we've made, Jesus would come and he would choose to sit at the well of our lives, knowing what we've done and what we've been through. And friend, that is the beauty of the gospel. The beauty is that while we were still sinning, while we were still making mistakes, Jesus would come and he would die in our place so that in him we could have new life. So she says, sir, you must be a prophet. And I'm going to tell you one more thing that's really interesting. Numerology is really important in the Bible. If you have a chance, you can dig into it later on. But the number seven is the number of completion. We're going to do some simple math really quick. Jesus said... That this woman has had five husbands, and the man she's with now, she's not even married to. That makes how many? Five plus one is? Six. Come on, 9 a.m. You got it. You could pass first grade math. Six. Then she has an encounter with one more man. His name is Jesus. Six plus one is? Seven. Seven, Seven is the number of completion in Scripture. Here's why that's important. It's important because what Jesus is doing is he's showing her that the very thing she's been waiting for her entire life, the things she's been searching for, longing for, and desired, can be completed in him. Amen. She says, sir, you must be a prophet. And then she goes on this conversation about where are we going to worship and where do Jews go to church at and all this other stuff. And Jesus doesn't really engage in the conversation because it's not fitting for what's happening. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we're, we'll talk our way out of what God is trying to do in us. But then the text keeps going, and the woman says this, I know the Messiah is coming, the one that we call the Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah, the person you've been waiting for, looking for, and longing for. You don't have to wait for anymore. He is here, and his name is Jesus. She, he's like, hey, you don't have to keep looking. I'm right here in front of you. And then the disciples came back, and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. 
but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Why are you talking to her? Then the woman left her water jar beside the well, and she ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. When we look at the text, we see the disciples come back, and the disciples are in, they're like, why in the world would Jesus be talking to this woman? Oftentimes, we don't understand what God is trying to do in somebody's life when he's trying to do it. But just because you don't think God could change somebody doesn't mean he can't. So they're having this conversation. They're not willing to talk to Jesus about it. But it says that the woman left her water jar, which is a beautiful depiction for us of what it looks like when we actually receive Jesus as our Savior. The water jar, her coming to the well, she has removed her ability to draw water now. She's leaving behind an old way of life, and she's pursuing the things of God. And as she runs into this village, her response is, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did, which is not true. Again, I tell you, I read scripture pretty logically. He pointed out one issue. I'm pretty sure you have more. Jesus didn't come and tell her everything she had ever done in that moment, but what is she trying to articulate? Here's the good news. You don't even have to get it right and articulate it well for people to come to know Jesus. You just have to get behind, you have to leave stuff behind and be willing to go tell. She says, come and see someone who told me everything I ever did. What she's trying to articulate is there is a man who knew all of my issues. He knew the things I had done. He knew my shortcomings and my wrongdoings. And he still chose to come and to talk to me and offer me a free gift of salvation. He offered me new life. He offered me hope. He offered me peace. Because when I understand who Jesus is and what he's done, I am compelled to go tell others. This is what this sermon series, this text, this message, this whole series is going to be about for four weeks. When I understand who Jesus is, that he's not just some good teacher or some social justice warrior, but he is fully God and fully man. He is the savior of the world. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who starts and ends. He is the God who declared on the cross, it is finished. When I understand who he is and what he did for me, that when he was hanging on that cross, having the full authority and power of God, at any moment he could have gotten off the cross. But he thought of me and he thought of you and he stayed there. He was obedient to the point of death. When I think about that, when I understand who he is and what he's done, I can't help but go tell other people. When it clicked in her mind who Jesus is and what he had done, she immediately left and went to tell other people. Because I believe the mark of transformation is communication. If I'm not willing to tell you about something, it probably hasn't changed my life. But when I get ready to tell you about something that has changed my life. I not only have experienced transformation, but I solidify the experience that I had. That's right. Jesus set me free from a drug addiction on August, 12, August 1st of 2011. And can I tell you when he did that, I couldn't help but tell people. Yeah. I, I was so passionate. I was so excited. I was fired up and energized. I'd been saved. I, I lived my first Bible study after being saved for about 10 minutes. I don't, rec- I don't recommend that for everybody. That's just what happened in my story. But can I tell you, even in the, in the days and the months and a few years after I'd given my life, life to Jesus, there were people who were waiting for the change to fall away. But the reason, the number one reason why it never, never faded was because I never quit telling people about it. I never quit telling people about how good God was and what he could do in their life. And I think what this woman is saying, even as she's going into the town, remember, she's going to draw water at noon because she's avoiding the people of the town. They already knew what she had done. But there's a God who knew it too. And while they pushed her away, he drew near. And that's the beauty of the gospel. 
we don't have any problem being compelled to preach about the new productivity app that changed our life, that workout plan, that new energy drink, or even a new pellet smoker, right? Come on. <laughs> we ain't got no problem telling people about that stuff because we experienced some temporary transformation from a small shift. But God has given us something eternal to hold on to, to draw near to. And if we embrace the call that he has on all of our lives as followers of Jesus, we'll not just sit where we are, but we'll be compelled to go and to share Jesus with the rest of the world. Which leads me to the last passage of text. Because sometimes we wonder, why? Why in the world would I go and share Jesus with people. This is what the text says. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village for two days. So he stayed for two days. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have experienced him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Here's why it matters for you and I to be compelled to go share our faith with other people. Because our story alone does not save anybody. God rescued me from a drug addiction. It was powerful. It was incredible. I can share that story with you, but that story does not get you into heaven because I didn't die for your sin. And in all honesty, I don't plan to. But Jesus did. And the reason why it's important is because at some point, we have to shift from hearing about him to knowing him personally. And we live in the South and we've got a lot of people who have heard about Jesus their whole life. They grew up where grandma talked about it, where you sat at the kitchen table, you had some good old homemade Southern style biscuits. She told you about Jesus and that's great. But grandma's faith can't get us to heaven. At some point, every single person has to experience him for themselves. And once we experience him, the shift happens. Because I can only be, this is why I tell people, our goal for a Sunday morning, it's gonna sound superficial, I know, but I'll tell you why. My goal for a Sunday morning is that you come back next week. Yeah. And the reason is, I've learned, if you can get into an environment where you experience him for long enough, you can't help but know that he's the savior of the world. It's not a one and done. We, this, is, this is not a one-stop shop. I want you to come back because I know if you get around Jesus for long enough, you'll experience his goodness, you'll experience his presence, you'll experience his power, and the end result is that you declare he is the savior of the world. But he's not just the savior of the world, he's the savior of my soul. That's what God wants for you, and that's what he wants for me. But it starts, here's the cycle. We are broken. Jesus meets us where we are. We accept him as Lord and Savior. We go and tell others. And the cycle repeats in somebody else's life. Over and over and over again. Why do I want you to be compelled? Because you were made as a follower of Jesus to preach the good news to the entire world to let them know that there's a God who knew everything they had ever done and still chose to come and die in their place. That's the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. But for some of us, it's not just enough to get passionate about telling other people about Jesus because we are more closely related to the woman in the story where we have not declared Jesus as our Savior ourselves. 
We may have been banking our entire life on church attendance or Bible studies or small groups, all different things, even prayer. And I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. I think you need to do all of those, but those things do not save you. Only Jesus saves you. The worst news in the world is that my salvation involves me doing something. Because it's not by works. It's by faith that we're saved. So with every head bowed, every eye closed across the room this morning, maybe you're here. And you've been banking on something else for salvation. Maybe You've been drawing from a well in this world, whether it's relationships or drugs or alcohol, even just sin, and you keep going back over and over and over, and you've been wondering, why is it not enough? Because you were made for more. And you were made for those longings and desires to be fulfilled by God's Spirit. And so if you're in here this morning, and you need to begin a relationship with Jesus to get and receive that living water that becomes a fresh bubbling spring within you. Would you just indicate that you need to make that decision by lifting your hand straight in the air and saying, hey, that's me. Here's what we're gonna do, church. Nobody prays alone, we're all gonna pray together. Will you repeat this after me? Dear Jesus, Today, I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for checking out this week's message. If you made any decisions for Jesus or you need a next step or have a prayer request, let us know by going to www propel.church slash hub that leads you to our digital connect card where you can fill out all of that information as well as see what we have coming up here at propel thank you again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon